a million actresses you could have chosen. Why Laura? Oh, frankly, first of all, Laura is a phenomenal actress and she plays authentically in a way that many actresses don't. You know, just in terms of even her looks, she looks like a real person. Um, and she's just so nuanced. And frankly, she's always had a proclivity to take difficult roles. I mean, she did a film, you know, called Smooth Talk when she was a teenager about rape, when nobody was talking about rape. You know, she did a film about abortion when nobody was talking about abortion. She was actually the first person to ever kiss a woman in a quote lesbian scene on TV so she's got enormous courage and uh, we really needed someone with courage to play this role because it was before the Me Too movement and Time's Up and Harvey Weinstein it was before people really started to talk openly and in an era where um, dozens of women are screening Me Too and, and Time's Up how did you feel um, this film would be received? Well, again, we made the film before that era, so we were shaking in our boots thinking, oh my God, you know, audiences are going to run screaming and critics will pan it. And luckily, you know, the lid was blown off this issue uh, in the fall of 2017, and the film was released at Sundance in the uh, January of 2018. And it was like the film that people were waiting to see that actually expressed something even beyond the Me Too movement, which was basically about assault. Because I really think child sexual abuse is even more taboo than assault and rape. So it sort of went one step further and it's been amazing. I mean, we started at Sundance a year ago and to, you know, we had five standing ovations at Sundance and it was just the talk of the festival and it's gone on to be on HBO and to go around the world and millions and millions have seen it. So the film seems to be water that people are ready, you know, to drink when they're thirsty. I think it's exactly what I said, which is that, you know, again, we were, we were developing this long before Me Too and Time's Up, and people were afraid. And that means that anybody who did sign in, like Laura Dern, took enormous risk, or Jason Ritter, who played Bill, or our producers, um, everyone who worked on the film, or the cinematographers that did work on it, we're like saying, no, this is important. This is a really good script. We need to make it, but we don't know. So I think, you know, we really have to be grateful for all the people who worked on this film and the actors that put their careers on the line to risk telling such a difficult story. Now it looks like, oh, wow, this is just so current. But when we made it, we were way ahead of the times. Well, first of all, to be totally clear, she didn't play those explicit moments. There's a body double. And in fact, Jason Ritter and Isabel Nolis, the little girl, were never in any of those scenes together. She was shot on a vertical bed alone, uh, and she wasn't even told what the scene was about. She was just showing me faces that we had rehearsed, act like a dog is chasing you. Uh, act like you're eating something sour, act like um, you're flirting, for example. So she rolled through these faces, sort of like putting money in a jukebox, not having any sexual content. And they were cut, you know, with the magic of film, with shots of Jason working with an uh, adult body double. So when the mother read the script, you know, and we spoke, she understood how we were gonna make it. She thought it was important and she let her daughter read it, who at the time was 11. She read the script and then she and I Skyped 
uh, for about an hour and a half and she asked me all these questions, but she wasn't afraid of the script. And uh, she told her mother that she wanted to do it to protect other girls from this happening to them. And then uh, Isabel Nalise is from Canada. She's from Montreal. So I flew to Montreal to audition her after that and um, and spoke to her mom. And I just loved her. She's so natural. And I it was really hard to find a, a child that young who could play so naturally. Many young American actresses and actors are so taught to be like disney like really fake and it was just wrong for the part so we spoke about how we would handle the scenes and how they would be shot and um, remember also she was highly monitored on set she had a, um, a studio teacher her mother Kate was there the whole time with her the dog came the producers were there we had a child psychologist someone from Screen Actors Guild so everything, you know, she was very, very, very protected. And we did everything to make sure that this film didn't traumatize her. Oh, it was a big change. I had to really learn a lot of new skills. And um, the writing, ironically enough, was a skill was was the easiest because I've written all my life. And writing also had a lot to do with research and meeting the people and taking transcripts and boiling them down. Very similar to editing a documentary. Um, but shooting is very different than documentary shooting. It's almost the inverse. We had 120 people on the crew, um, big actors, you know, uh, my first fiction. So it was really high stress. When I worked as a documentarian, I was alone with a camera. I shoot my own films uh, in real life with real people. I mean, it couldn't be different, more different. So a lot, a lot to learn. That's a great question because all of us think that our memories are true and I think what I discovered even from my own life in the making of this film is that our memories are actually just stories that we have told ourselves and they are versions of what happened um, and they're the versions we chose to hold on to of what happened but potentially there are many other versions that could even be truer. Um, or not so but the other thing I think I learned from this process of understanding myself was that it's actually less important that the stories are exactly true but that the stories help you survive and function because ultimately as human beings survival is the most important thing and trauma happens to everyone um, but really what we want to do is to be able to keep going. And so, in fact, the tale is about a story I told myself that helped me survive. It was only part of the truth. And I wouldn't even say it wasn't true. It was only part of the truth. And the other part, of course, is very dark about child sexual abuse. The part I told myself was the good stuff, that I felt special. I felt loved. That was true. But I also was hurt and damaged by what happened. And that piece, it took me much, much later until I was middle-aged to even begin to face because the damage was too tough for me to face. But what I appreciate about the story I told myself and what my child self did was that she chose a story that could make her stronger and make her grow up into adulthood and function. That it wasn't the whole story is okay because I could go on, I could become a filmmaker, I could travel the world, I could have relationships with the story I told myself. I hope that makes sense.
Well, you know, I think the purpose of the film is to show the very complexity of child sexual abuse and that it isn't black and white. It doesn't fit neatly into boxes. And in doing so, I actually have helped other people accept the complexity of their own abuse and come forward in their own lives. Also, showing a functioning person who was abused is very important because also the black and white telling is usually about someone in the corner crying who can't get up every day. Most people who are abused are functioning, even though they have parts of them that are damaged. In terms of me, you know, this whole process has been about facing the fact, A, that I was abused, and also that, yes, as much as I hate the word victim, I was also a victim as much as I am a survivor. And to really start to face the hurt parts of me.